Uh, is it Molly? Or... Yes, I'm recording. Oh, hey, Molly. Hey, Molly. Are, you, Molly. are you also like, letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Everybody, I wish we were in person sitting in a conference room in Verdine, but at the same time, we wouldn't have so many people, so many visitors from afar. So that's exciting too. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, don't you think, Kirill? Yes. Kirill I and I usually the, start by fun. introducing ourselves just because there's always some newcomers here. So my name's Mary Neuberger. I'm a professor of history here at UT Austin. And I'm also the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the chair of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. And Kirill is my co-host. Thank you very much, Miri. My name is Kirill Avramov, and I'm, for those of you that do not know me, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. And uh, we would love to welcome you to yet another Friday for all things Balkan. Uh, we are having uh, an exciting guest today, uh, Change of Focus, uh, which is good. Um, and I'm so glad actually to see uh, so many familiar, but also new faces. Dr. Neuberger, would you like to introduce our speaker for today? Yes, I'm so excited to introduce Samantha Farmer today. She's our own homegrown, homespun Balkanist, up and coming. <laughs> Uh, so Samantha is a master's candidate in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies here at UT. She'll be finishing up her thesis this semester, I believe. Um, her BA was also in, our, in history and in our department in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at UT. And um, research interests let, were, are sort of at the intersection of area studies, comparative literature, queer studies, and translation with a particular focus on Balkan and Central East European literature and film. So we're really excited to hear Samantha's talk today. Thank you. Did you need to screen share? Yes, I do. Um, I will admit Let's I'm see, reading, sorry. but I have a visual focus. Um, okay, there we go. You should be able to share screen, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Um, I wanna, Thank Dr. Meinerberger and Dr. Kilo Abramov for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to have this platform, um, especially as someone who's attended Balkan Circle since it was in Burdine. It's nice to come full circle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, as the title of my talk suggests, today I'm gonna to be talking about the work of the filmmaker Dana Budasavlevich and the writer and dramaturg Yasnish Mak. Um, what I'm presenting is a work in progress of a chapter of my master thesis. Um, so there are some things that need to be ironed out, but I'd really like feedback um, on the content theme, particularly maybe how these two artists work together. Um, and yeah, I am going to give it a go. Thank you. Floor is yours. <clears throat> Um, Eve Sedgwick and Michael Moon write that, quote, queer lives and impulses do not occupy a separate social or physical space from straight ones. Instead, they are relational and conditional, moving across and transforming conventional spaces of unstable normative systems of sex, gender, and family, end quote. This occupation of the same space, however, often overlooks the fact that this space, which may confer wholeness to some, but be inimical to the flourishing of others whose gender and sexuality, quote, aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. It is with this shared space in mind that I look to the way space is made and shared with queerness in Croatian film and literature, um, particularly in the works of Dana Budisavljevic and Jasnaš Mak through practices of auto-representation and reparation. Although queer characters or themes are not wholly absent in either literature or film from this region to the extent that one can clearly identify or prove what is queer and what is not, um, the manner in which they have been depicted has been criticized as problematic or one-dimensional. And I would note this is not unique to Croatia, probably a global problem. And Jasnaj Mak claims that Croatian drama has yet to see, quote, its first real LGB LGBTQ plus play. Um, since it has been devoid of nearly all queer characters, except for gay cisgender men, who are more often than not only superficial or, quote, apparitional. 
Natalia Stepanovich argues that Croatian queer literature has a surprisingly long history, which is accelerated in post-war Croatia and marked by the familiar tropes of coming out, moving away, and traveling to more progressive climes. With regards to mainstream film, however, queer characters are often marginalized or brutally, brutally disciplined in service of larger plots. When they are the focus, they are allegories for uncooperative bodies that cannot be made to fit the nation, what Diana Jelic calls, quote, an illness in the healthy body of the national collective. In this, they suffer a similar fate as other minorities in post-socialist film, most notably migrants, Roma, or other racialized outsiders who face both a lack of nuanced representation as well as a lack of control in crafting their own image within the hegemonic culture in which they are embedded. Dina Yordanova claims that such films are shot by the dominant group for the dominant group's entertainment. The image of the lesbian in particular has been a particularly troublesome figure. As Aniko Imre argues, but across Balkan and East European cinema, she is defined by tragedy and the impossibility of her existence. These negotiations of representation have occurred against the backdrop of an embattled fight that has seen both the expansion and removal of legal protections for LGBTQ individuals. In Croatia specifically, in 2013, a referendum spearheaded by the organization in the name of the family was passed, which defined marriage in the Croatian constitution as strictly between a man and a woman, prompting criticism from LGBTQ advocacy groups as a curtailing of legal freedoms. These legislative struggles and the increase in the number of pride parades in Croatia, quote, confronted the public sphere with images of real gay and lesbian communities and their everyday concerns, Sonia Lachan writes. Boyan Bilic notes that the appeal to human rights discourse, which is so common to LGBTQ activism, developed in the 1990s during the Yugoslav wars among feminist and anti-war activists as the only feasible framework for international recognition and funding. However, Andrea Filipovic criticizes the overdependence of LGBTQ activists on human rights discourses, which he argues values, which he argues value legislative representation, recognition, and quote, freedom as the basic human right, end quote, instead of engagement with larger structural issues. Keeping this context in mind, I'd like to now turn to Yasna Zhmak's novel in short prose, My Dear You, and Donna Budisavlevich's documentary film, Family Meals, as examples of texts that operate in the cultural, cultural sphere parallel to activist efforts. They are nuanced and much more complex representations of queerness as a socially relational and performative identity that draws on Zhmak and Bodhisattvavich's own autobiographies as publicly out lesbians, correcting delimiting representations of queer life or perhaps more accurately, queer death. In doing so, they take as their object of critique seemingly closed and immutable systems Croatian language and the nuclear family and reshape them in a manner that accommodates queerness rather than structurally negates it. In what follows, I will first look to Budisavlevich's film. Um, and I argue that she is what I'm gonna term a quote, lesbica with a video camera. Um, and she does so by turning her documentarian's camera on her own family to interrogate their decade long silence over her coming out as well as her own complicity in her family's characteristic dysfunction. Um, this confrontation is staged over the ritual of family meals and is cast as an airing of dirty laundry. Um, this juxtaposes silence with conversation and dialogue, which Budisavlevich promotes as the antidote to silence. I will then turn to Zhmak and show how she manages to map out a space for um, a better accommodation of fluid queerness in particularly Croatian language itself, a gendered language. Um, I actually think it'd be good to start the trailer now. I was going to play the trailer of this film to get a good grasp of it. Let me know if you don't hear it, I suppose. We can read, but we can't we can, hear. We can't so. hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in Croatian anyway, so subtitles are probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do share sound though when you shared or? Probably not. I can unshare and do it if you'd like or subtitles are okay. Yeah, I kind of want to hear it. Okay. Just, yeah, I think if you quickly unshare it and then you know where the share sound little thing is you have to click, right? In the lower left corner when you go into, yeah. Yeah, left.
Naime, meni je sve u, u ovom svijetu nelogično i izbrkano i pogotovo me brak jako me užasava i ne mogu nikad sam sa sobom izaći na tu temu. Jer mi jednostavno nejasno da ti možeš cijeli, odnosno možda može neko, ali mi se čini da ako neko iskren prema sebi, da ne može jednostavno cijeli život biti s jednom osobom. Ja mislim da se tata isto baš veseli što zapravo dolazi. E, ali to, to neće pokazivati, nego će malo ono... <coughs> I onda će spustiti tu i tamo dve, tri Aha. stvari, da ne bi ispao da se veseli. Jer to isto spada u jednu, kako se to kaže, građansku kulturu, da nije sramota pokazati neraspoloženje, ali radost i ljubav je uvijek opasno, jer tu već te neko može na slabom naći. A zašto misliš sada da je mama tako gadno zapravo reagirala? Na tebe? Da. Zašto A ja ne znam sam... uopće kako ona reagira. Pa ti misliš da ti ja nisam dala podršku? Pa nisi da. Molim te lijepo što ti misliš pod podrškom. Ja te nisam ometala. A kaj to nije podrška? Nisi me osudila, ali nisi... O, pa šta bi još sad trebalo? Da ti vjenčića plete mi. Pa zašto ne? Kao ono, šlorbero, mama, daj molim te. Kako da je neko meni pletio vjenčiće s obzirom što sam ja u životu radila? Ja sam to zna da radim protiv pravila i uzela sam si to pod račun. A ti meni kaži gdje su sad, gdje si ti to pročitala i ko je tebi govorio da život je jedna pjesma, Havaja, i da je sve super i da samo treba plovit kroz to da sve ide. Pa kako, k- k- dit je težina, dit je, dit je nešto. Ok, uh, we also get the title of the film in Croatian there, Life's not a tropical song. Um, and I'm going to keep going. Um, in her criticism of Dalibor Matinić's 2002 film, Find Dead Girls, Mima Simić asks why the first, quote, celluloid lesbians, in quote, in Croatian film had to die. However, she also predicts the possibility that, quote, a new celluloid lesbian might succeed in acquiring from some cultural artistic EU fund enough money for a feature length autobiographical story, which might finally grant lesbians like Simić a happy ending. Dana Budisavljevic steps into this role of the new celluloid lesbian with her documentary film, Family Meals, which was released in 2012 and became one of the most watched documentaries in Croatia of that year. Over 50 minutes of lunches, coffees, and dinners, Donna holds conversations with her mother, father, and brother about why they reacted so poorly to her coming out a decade prior. The topic is one that they have seemingly never broached and upon which they have stayed silent. As you can see in the trailer, Budisavljevic uses her own life as artistic material but I think that the film is perhaps more about her family as a site of flexible social relations or a habitus um, than a documentary that actually centers the everyday life of Donna. Although, as I will point out, there is a brief moment in which Buddha Savlevich um, discloses herself to the viewer in a more direct and intimate way. Documentary for film as a medium has a history of activistic attachments. Like photography, documentary film has the reputation of being able to uniquely address social injustice by confronting the viewer with what seems unquestionably real and therefore engendering something akin to sympathy. With the advent of digital technologies, it is an even more portable, spontaneous, and affordable medium, even if underfunded. In China in the late 1980s and 1990s, the new documentary movement utilized documentary film as a means to, quote, open up a new public space for discussion of social problems, end quote. The critic Chao Xiyan points to the productive co-opting of this movement and in the late 1990s and 2000s by feminists and lalas or lesbians with video cameras who sought to introduce not only feminist societal concerns but also queer representation into these new public spaces made possible by documentary film. These films make lesbians and local Tongji queer culture in China visible to mainstream audiences, although they also carry an ethnographic aura as a result of their consciousness raising function. They must prove their authenticity to the viewer. This raises problematic questions about the agency queer subjects have in their representation and subsequent consumption as cultural commodity at the same time that it centers misrepresented or marginalized experiences excluded from dominant discourses of representation. I find Chao's category of quote, lalas with video cameras, itself a riff on Zhang Jin's women with video cameras 
after Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, useful in thinking about Budisavlevich's documentary, Family Meals. Chow's lalas with video cameras are activist filmmakers who not only identify with the myriad of experiences possible in being lesbian, but who also work to improve their standing in the larger society in which they and their subjects are embedded. Their work is, quote, premised on a sensitivity to their specific socio-political conditions. As a result, this filmmaking is inextricable from contemporaneous activism in the same socio-political context. Although influenced by human rights discourses that may homogenize LGBTQ activism globally, this filmmaking still grounds itself in local social formations, communities, and languages. Similarly, I argue that Donna Budisavlovich's family meals can be seen as the work of a, quote, lesbica with a video camera. There is no separation between the subjects of the film and the invisible documentarian posing the questions as Budisavlovich inserts herself into the film as a participant. Her unquestioned and public outness as a lesbian lends the film the veneer of authenticity, assuring the viewer that what they're seeing is representative of a queer subject and her concerns, even if it does, um, I will say, center the experiences of her family primarily. The manner in which Budisavlevich her, presents herself belies her discomfort as well as her unhappiness as a result of her family's silence and presumed non-acceptance of her. Her parents cannot even speak her queerness out loud. They never once name her as gay or lesbian or attracted to women. Um, she particularly only describes herself, Donna, as gay or that she's attracted to women. She never actually speaks the word lesbian in the film. Although the tone of family meals is generally light in many conversations, Budusavlovich is visibly uncomfortable, stiff, and withdrawn, and occasionally upset by her family's comments, particularly her mother's repeated mourning of the loss of Donna's feminine appearance or the foreclosed possibility of having grandchildren. Although, as her mother says, she doesn't tell her friends that Dana is gay, she just tells them that Donna doesn't like anybody. Herein lies the subtle activistic work of Buddha Savlevich. She is what Sarah Ahmed names the, quote, unhappy queer, who is, quote, an unhappy object for many parents by refusing dominant gendered happiness scripts. Happiness scripts are, in Ahmed's words, quote, straightening devices, end quote, that provide a blueprint for happiness or the good life, which ultimately orients subjects towards the path of least resistance and heterosexuality. Bodhisattva deviation from this script is signaled by her coming out and opting out of heterosexuality, as well as out of the role of a woman of use to the maintenance and reproduction of the nation. In doing so, she troubles what Rada Ivekovich calls, quote, the tale of gender roles as fixed and definitive within the nation. By narrating her own unhappiness, Bodhisattva makes a, quote, gesture towards another world beyond the present. The titular setting of the family meal as a ritual that repeats provides a space to reconsider and therapeutically process the injuries of the past, which were papered over by the same silence that caused Budisavlevich so much harm. Her mother is able to acknowledge over the dinner table how difficult it was for her to be kicked out of her house at a young age by her own father and her guilt about failing Donna and her brother as a mother. Her father is able to admit over the dinner table that his own repressed familial upbringing discouraged outpourings of emotion and support for Donna when she needed it most. Oop, do not open the apps. Um, I have this scene here. If, oh, it's paused. Um, you can, can you see this? Okay. Um, I have this, you can read the screen caps um, in which her father tells him that uh, for the first time that the first time his mother kissed him was three days before she died. Um, and that they can't mend the past, only go forward and continue to heal. And Sonia Lechon argues that these types of narration as continuous acts of communal storytelling between Donna and family members, quote, uncovers her family's own queerness, end quote, and distance from heteronormative expectations of monogamy, marriage, and even an adherence to norms of health and abled bodiness. In the case of her brother, Surjan, who um, ends up getting cancer as a young man. Budisavlevich's initial unhappiness has thus taken the form of, quote, political action, the act of saying no or pointing out injuries as an ongoing present. We see this forward momentum or futurity in the closing scene of Family Meals, in which Donna and her mother must now clean up the messes they have been making, literally and metaphorically. I have this here again, so you can read it. Um, her mother in a rare moment of vulnerability, 
admits that cleaning, quote, of the soul is a necessary task to undertake in order for the future to be any better or perhaps happier than the present. The originally closed off form of Bodhisattva's family is thus broken, dirtied up, and reparatively reformed. At the end of the day, Family Meals is an autobiographical film, but one that I argue turns the camera onto Bodhisattva's family more than actually onto Donna herself. This, is, this perhaps provides an access point for audiences who may not feel they can sympathize with Donna as a lesbian, but they can sympathize with her mother and father. However, in a carefully curated disclosure of herself, Bodhisattva as an editor has placed a short montage of clips, nearly 40 minutes into the film, in which the viewer is briefly privileged with a look at what Donna might really look like behind closed doors, as it were. I have attached stills from the short clip here, and I think it's only right that I close my discussion of Bodhisattva with these images she chose to show of herself in just this way. For the first time, we see Donna introduce herself to the camera as if she were a different person than the one with whom the viewer has spent most of the film and announces, my name is Donna and I'm waiting for her to come. The aspect ratio appears to change for this montage, taking on a smaller, more intimate frame, like a home movie. We no longer see Buddha as a nervous adult child, but for the first time as a happy queer, filming her partner eating an orange in dappled sunlight instead of the stark lighting of her parents' dining rooms, and she asks her partner how long it all will last. This short clip, which lasts less than a minute, perhaps hints at the kind of film that Nima Simic truly had in mind when she said that one day a celluloid lesbian would make a real autobiographical story with a happy ending. And I'm gonna to transition to Jamak now, but I will note, I think it's kind of impossible to talk about documentary, lesbian or queer documentary filmmaking in Croatia without mentioning Nima Simic, who has managed to get herself into several other documentary films about lesbians in Croatia, including the project once again by Anna Opalic and Noah Penteric, as well as a documentary about her own relationship, Mima and Marta, an activist love story. Unlike the autobiographical nature of Budisavljevic's film, if I can transition. Unlike the autobiographical nature of Budisavljevic's family meals, Jasna Zmak's My Dear You is autofictional. It is narrated not by Zmak, but by a fictionalized version of Zmak, the writer Jasna, who is, quote, woven from the words of her fiction, end quote, and who loses track of what is truth and what is fiction. Jasna is writing a novel about her relationship with her first girlfriend, the only other character in the novel, who is never named except as you. I will continue to refer to this character as you instead of her partner or her girlfriend, but I know that it sounds a little strange in English. Whereas Jmach's fiction creates a, quote, rarefied and self-contained universe of its own, end quote, in which Jasna can be any version of herself, the pathos of Bodhisattva's film lies in the, quote, accuracy of its correspondence to the world outside itself. That does not mean that Jmach has not written herself into My Dear You. The open-ended genre of autofiction, quote, reinvents the identity of the person of the author as that of a fictional personage. Autofiction, along with the often intertwined genres of memoir, essay, and auto theory, have become increasingly fertile ground for writers whose lived experiences are rarely represented in the mainstream and which can, quote, destabilize the lived, ex the, destabilize the universalizing voice of the straight white male subject as a result. Since the oft-cited rallying cry that the personal is political, and even before, utilizing autobiography and writing has been utilized as a feminist and queer strategy, as evidenced by autofictive works like Audre Lorde's biomythography, Zami, a new spelling of my name, that echoes Helene Sixu's call for a woman to write herself. And Yasna does write herself. However, she is swiftly confronted with the rigid structure of the Croatian language, to which she has difficulty conforming. She has an antagonistic relationship towards Croatian, which is to say the monolingual standard, which Yasmin Yildiz calls the quote, access point for the individual in an ideological system. This proper Croatian is tied to linguistic purism and the importance of language in the public sphere, which Mate Kapovic argues rose to prominence in the 1990s when it was necessary to produce a unique standard language that was sufficiently Croatian enough which meant free from words perceived as Serbian or overly referential to communist Yugoslavia. Although Yugoslavia never appears by name in the main text of My Dear You, it is through absence that it makes itself known. For example, in the story in Cyrillic, Yu's lack of knowledge of Cyrillic is tied directly to her having been born a generation too late to wear the quote, red neck scarves and blue hats of Tito's pioneers. To even see the Cyrillic 
To even see Cyrillic beyond the pages of vintage Serbian newspapers, they have to visit Belgrade, and Zmak emphasizes the border crossings each way that are necessary to do so. Yu, however, is a Croatian linguist and is bothered by Jasna's anglicisms, foreign loanwords, and Chakabian dialect from her hometown in Istria. Jasna defies these concerns by freely peppering her stories with a multilingual mixture of languages, alphabets, and dialects that expand Croatian and denaturalize its status as a mother tongue from which national belonging is derived. In the story entitled Croatian, she writes, I believed that from the very inside, I could connect Croatian with other languages, that it still has plenty of space, that we will liberate it. The only linguistic problem she cannot completely solve, however, is gender. In the story Neuter, Yu asks Jasna if in one story she can, quote, be a boy. I have the quote of uh, an abridged text of the story. Yeah, I don't know if the slides are advancing because we still see the, it was not for nothing, but we can go backwards slide. It was not for nothing. Okay. You know, the, yes. I Sam, think yeah, was, people, the audience was asking. described another mm -hmm. set of pictures after that that we didn't ever see. Well, let's let you see them. Because <laughs> I really wanted to see those pictures. There we go. Yeah, like we okay. See that so here we just have the cover of Moya T um, and a brief mm -hmm. screenshot from the back of the book where she's compiled a lot of lists. And this one says a list of nouns whose gender I always forget. Um, but can we see the slide before just for a second? Before, yes, because it was not advanced. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, please okay. look this at this. This is the one we didn't. Yeah, this is the one we didn't get to see. This is where 40 minutes into the film, the film suddenly changes aspect ratio and mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not filmed on a tripod anymore. It's really kind of like handheld. Mm -hmm. The lighting is really yeah. low and it's just a really quick instance in which you see Donna in her own apartment with her presumably partner or girlfriend. Thank you. And uh, we're here again. And here's the text of the story I'm referencing, mm -hmm. heavily abridged. Um, I'm gonna just briefly run through it. Uh, she asks you, can I be a boy in one story? And I said, why not? But when I sat down to write the story, I realized that I don't know how, except grammatically, to make you masculine. Gender is one of the rare instances in which I like the real world better than language, because in language, at least in ours, there exist only three, masculine, feminine, neuter, while in the world, they're endless. And the truth is that we, you and I, are most often just that, something third, something in between, around, beyond, and over those two or three exclusive genders, we morph depending on the occasion. In all of my stories, or at least in just one, you and I should be a little masculine, a little feminine, and even a little neuter, since as long as I'm writing as in Croatian, we can't completely avoid gender. And although in English, the first person singular and second person singular are genderless in the original Croatian, it is immediately clear from the beginning of My Dear You that Jasna and you are written in the feminine grammatical gender with some fluctuations. Therefore, the novel cannot hide the lesbian nature of Jasna and you's relationship. The solution in avoiding gender for Zmak then is to take a fluid approach to gender and grammar and ignore its complicity in what Monique Wittig names the enforcement of sex in language. The story Love Story shows Zmak's anarchic approach to gender. Yasna searches all the dictionaries she can find for definitions of the word love. She becomes, quote, completely enraged when she finds out that the common link between the definitions of the word love, regardless of the dictionary, is the phrase, quote, person of the opposite sex. In the entirety of Love Story, the grammatical gender of both Yasna and you switches unpredictably between masculine to feminine from sentence to sentence with one regularity. In each sentence, regardless of whether Yasna is marked with masculine or feminine grammatical gender, you is marked with the same grammatical gender. Due to the assumed correlation between sex and gender in language, Yasna and you are written in such a way so that even though they are grammatically gender fluid and they never manage to satisfy the heteronormative definition of love as a feeling for quote, a person of the opposite sex when they still carry the markers of quote, the same sex in language. Therefore, at least in language, Zmak disturbs biological essentialism and the same grammatical structures that work to enforce its coherence, the same structures that bothered her so much at the beginning. The Croatian language, although still governed by the masculine, neuter, and feminine, becomes something that is capable of accommodating the ambiguities of gender and describing Jasna and you as not quite something third, but something, quote, for which dictionaries don't have a word yet. 
And I don't have a conclusion, so that's it. Thank I'm you. Audibly clap. <laughs> Since that's always the awkward thing about Zoom is people don't know whether to unmute. <laughs> Um, do you want to stop sharing screen maybe, Sam, so we can go back to seeing more faces without having to scroll? Of course, a lot of people have their faces muted anyway, but um, there's Chelsea, yay. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you don't have to unmute on my account, just saying. I know a lot of people are eating too during this hour, so that's all fine. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for this. This is really interesting. It's a lot of rich material and things I wasn't familiar with. Um, so I just want to open it up to questions. Does anyone want to get us started with questions for Sam or comments? Part of the conversation? Uh, okay. Eastgren? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eastgren. Thank you for this very exciting presentation, Samantha. I'm really impressed. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. He's currently an old Fulbright visiting scholar at Chris at UT Austin. Well, I have a question regarding your research on uh, this book. From my personal experience, I can say that on the Balkans, people could probably accept you much easier if you're a lesbian than of being gay. So I would like to ask you, do you think, and what's the contribution of religious institutions to this intolerance that you face? As particularly a lesbian or a gay man or any? No, particularly, universal question. Yeah. Um... I would say my speciality is not necessarily in sociology. Um, a result of COVID is I haven't been able to spend a lot of time in the region, but I would assume from just a general perspective, I think that in a lot of ways, speaking very generally, um, like theoretically a woman is still quite valuable to the nation building project and lesbians can still be integrated into that project quite easily. Um, a film that I, I mentioned in particular that's gotten a lot of scholarship, so I didn't particularly cover it, is Fine Dead Girls, um, in which you do see the forcible integration of uh, one girl and a lesbian couple into kind of this heterosexual relationship in which she's forced to bear a child. Um, when she, so I do think that from a conservative standpoint, I don't know if I can say that being a lesbian is more acceptable than being a gay man. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably just say that I think there's a lot of there's a lot surrounding the cult of womanhood that is much more fluid perhaps that can be forced one can be forced into thank you Sam for uh, for and thank you for the question um before everyone else continues I would be I'd be curious Sam just to tell us because you said this part today of today's presentation is is a uh, actually is a chapter right, of a, of a larger work. Uh, and just, just to outline for us, you know, how that fits into a larger construction, you know, with the research question and, you know, how, you know the larger mosaic, you know, just to get the perspective on, on the entire project and its completion, if possible, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm approaching my master's thesis, maybe not from a coherent argument that builds in each chapter, but I'm kind of trying to workshop a frustration that I've had as a student, feeling that in various disciplines, um, the disciplines that I'm interested, namely, let's say, comparative literature, area studies, mm -hmm. this region and translation, people are communicating in between them, but it, it often feels like they're siloed. And I wanted to combine all my research interests in a lot of different ways. So in this chapter, I'm looking at queer literature, um, translation, more so in the longer chapter with Jmach, that's actually a translation project I'm undertaking um, mm -hmm. with the author. Um, I also think Jmach presents a lot of interesting problems being translated into English when gender in Croatian is so important, as mm -hmm. is the issue of the nuances between the Serbianisms she uses and the Cyrillic, how to mm -hmm. even replicate that in, 
English, which is so monolingual. Um, and then my second chapter is kind of considering really a more class-based understanding of queerness in kind of like the semi-peripheral region of Eastern Europe, which sounds really scientific at the time, but I think it's the best way to describe it um, in the sense that I think that there in queer studies are holes in which deviations from gender roles are queer, but they're not readily, they're not readily identifiable as being queer in a restrictive understanding of queer as a quote unquote non-normative sexuality. And I think that you see a lot of particularly the kind of queering of gender roles um, directly connected to class in two texts. And one is Hana Yushita's films, Quit Staring at My Plate, in which you see kind of a really impoverished corner of Shibenik in Dalmatia. And then um, the novel Adios Cowboy by Olya Savicevich, in which you also kind of have an alternative depiction of um, split not as a kind of tourist dreamland, but really the results of decades of um, transition and gentrification mm -hmm. that have left the original residents really kind of on the margins. On the margins. So that's... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam. You know, it's very interesting and complicated, fascinating, because it seems that you're, you're having this multi-purpose approach, you know, to address, address those gaps. And this is why the reason I was asking, you know, where the chapter goes into a larger, uh, into the larger project. And it seems that you're pursuing multiple objectives. Um, <clears throat> and at this point of time, if you allow me, I'm going to ask Vlad uh, Baronia uh, to um, put his comment and question. Vlad. Thank you. Um, Sam, I'm really impressed uh, at how far this chapter has progressed. And uh, it's really wonderful to see you kind of tie these uh, two pieces together. Uh, and uh, in these, uh, you know, through this space of the family and the space of the language, which are really these kind of privileged sites of nationhood. Uh, and so I think you do a really nice job teasing that out and, you know, thinking about how the nation is queered on the one hand. And so, um, so I guess my question is kind of going forward. I have two questions. What I think both of them kind of open up a Pandora's box and I'm sorry for that, but I'm going to uh, um, just to sort of gesture at, you know, where you're going with this. So uh, first of all is, uh, the first question being about, um, you know, thinking about uh, when you were saying about queerness as being socially relational and performative, and uh, I would add, what is the space of embodied queerness uh, in, uh, in your analysis? So thinking about, you know, meta sort of these performative aspects of queerness, which might be uh, kind of more expansive in a way, versus uh, embodied notions of queerness and sexual practice that are, um, you know, socially clocked much more and much more visible. And uh, so they become sort of this object of violence, right? By socially sort of heteronormative systems. Um, so thinking about that uh, on the one hand, um, and I think that's a very fluid discussion as well. I mean, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's an open discussion. Uh, and then the second thing would be um, kind of, do you think that the nation can be queered? Or do you think as a system, uh, you know, it's something that uh, is kind of inherently to use, you know, to use that word, um, and violently heteronormative and patriarchal. Uh, and I know that's in, a big question. Immutable in a sense, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a big question. And I don't, you know, I don't obviously expect you to answer it, but I think, you know, your project is gesturing towards that in a way. And, um, you know, these texts as well. Uh, and just thinking about this sort of, you know, reparative mode. Does the reparative mode, does it replace the nation or does it, you know, change it in some way? Yeah. I will start by saying I personally am really skeptical of the nation in general, but I'm going to answer your first question um, on embodied queerness. I thought because 
particularly Jmach kind of is very interested in gender as performative, particularly through language and speak, speech acts. And she, she references um, Wittgenstein and, and Austin as like doing things with words all the time. And she also kind of intertextually references Judith Butler in a story that's not published in the collection, but on her Tumblr called Nebel Yasabolidima, which is like, sounds like the translation of gender trouble, Nebel Yasarodom. So I feel like it's really referencing it. And it's all about like performing drag using the ends of like, what are they called? Like marked endings, like a feminine plumber versus a plumber in Croatian. Um, and because Jmak kind of like is invoking that herself, I almost brought in Butler and I'm glad I didn't with your question maybe, um, <laughs> because it seems like that's what you're asking after. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would say that with these texts, I don't necessarily know if they're right for considering a more embodied queerness that can't in a lot of ways be seen as performing because it can't be seen past the like physical shape it takes or like the way it moves. Um, so I don't really have an answer for that question other than I don't think that these texts are right for that. Um, we'll say one text that you actually did um, we like read in the classes, uh, S.P. Toma teaches Your Love is King, which is so much more about kind of like the physical experience of changing your body and being in your body with the juxtaposition of being trans and then going through like cancer surgeries in the form of the mother and the ways in which your body changes and kind of experience that really jettisons you from being able to even perform those categories of gender. Um, so I'd probably say that those are, that exists just maybe not super well in these texts. And I don't know if I want to force that on them, but with the nation, I'm really skeptical of being able to like queer the nation. I think that maybe some things can't be queered, particularly if the nation's an ethno national collective that exists upon the racialization and ejection of others and kind of like enforcing a patriarchal order for the reproduction of the nation. Um, I don't know if that can ever be properly queered. I think language and translation is a really good way to look at it though, particularly in the form of like jettisoning your belonging to the nation through your mother tongue, which Mach does. Um, and I think that Boris Budin does as well. He's written about that kind of like actively trying to like erase parts of his Croatian language and speak more like of Serbian parts of Serbian Croatian to like sabotage his own mother tongue from the inside. Um, I also think that's, yeah, particularly what like Derrida talks about in the minor, like a minor language. And yeah, you like can't really have a language that you, claim property to that like you are belonging into that linguistic community entails owning some sort of property that others don't have access to. Um, so maybe language, especially in the Balkans and in the former Yugoslavia, kind of like finding communal language that isn't predicated on the exclusion of others is a way to kind of queer <laughs> away from the nation and just get rid of it. We'll see. I don't know if that's going to happen. I think you need to include this in the chapter. What you're just saying, you know, this is, I think this would really enrich um, the discussion of, um, of these uh, texts. Um, so that's I, I agree also. There was, you know, there's a really good suggestion, Vlad, that, you know, did you just spelled it out and that probably will enrich the, the chapter itself. <clears throat> Dr. And Maria Weber? has a, has, well, I have a question. Oh, I'm too, sorry. But yeah, but, but actually, I'm like... going to let Maria go first because I my mind keeps changing and I keep like reformulating it. So maybe Maria's will help me reformulate it even more. So go ahead, Maria. Yes, thanks. I actually was wondering <laughs> um, to like Vlad kind of collapsed the family and the nation in his last question. Uh, but I was wondering, you're looking at these two different works and one places queerness in the context of a family and the other in the context of a national language and border crossing and all of that imaginary. So, but how are those actually, what do they reveal differently about queerness? How do they afford a different kind of articulation? And maybe this is a little bit more about that question of sort of 
embodied versus imaginary belonging. And I don't know. So just to sort of connect your two texts, maybe by saying how they afford different understandings of queerness. Love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think something I'm struggling with is, I think Buddha Savalich and Jamak exist really great on their own, but I'm having trouble connecting them with some really strong connective threads. Um, I don't know if they're exposing anything new about queerness. I would also say that like, eventually the idea of like what queerness is will change. And so it can't just only be exposing the same things, but I think there is something to be, something to be invested in in the project that Buddhist Havlovich undertakes in actually kind of like, instead of just treating coming out and being recognizably queer as like the, the end of your identity, a speech act that you're asked to do and that effectively like outs you and then you're done and people know you're queer, but it actually kind of turns that on to like the family or kind of like a population that feels like they don't have anything to gain or anything common in the project of queerness. Um, I think she really confronts her family with the fact that like they particularly as a family, as this kind of strange intellectual bourgeois family, really don't meet up with the standard image of the ideal family, but they keep telling themselves that they are because of the way they were raised or they're trying to remedy the mistakes that they made so that their children fit into that kind of happiness script better than they did. And I think that there's something really powerful about like confronting that dominant happy, happiness script with unhappiness and kind of having everybody be unhappy together and like divest themselves of that investment in kind of like the project of why they didn't feel comfortable talking about Dana and why they still can't name that queerness um, even after kind of this therapeutic family meal. Um, in language with regards to Jmak, I do think that personally, it's just a fact that a lot of queer scholarship and queer theory is really Anglo-centric, particularly with English. They don't really consider other languages. And I think that there's a lot to be done with considering how language expresses queerness and like experiences of queerness that don't align with the dominant kind of adoption of like human rights discourse, which kind of just transliterates everything. Um, literally into whatever the local version of what you can make out of LGBT is. Um, yeah, and actually, so Evren Safsi is doing that work in Turkey in particular with Turkish language um, that I think is really interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I've an answered your question. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Thank you. No, I think language might be a one way to look at it because in the sense in the movie, she's made to practice queerness and talking about queerness with others she has to address that are not at all part of the same right conversation yet um, as opposed to writing for an audience that's already interested in playing with language as an you know emblematic sort of diagram of identity uh, I don't know I think it's it's interesting to compare the different scales at which you know, language addresses people and who are the different and potential addressees and interlocutors. And it seems like in the film, she's able to really, you know, have a much more sort of, there's more participants involved that are kind of flesh and body uh, and have their own mysteries, which I mean, you made visible, I think with your nice summary of it, um, it seems like a different sort of game than the, the other language game of the novel. Anyway, thank you. Oh, yes, thank you for okay. coming. It's a softies book. It just sure. came out. It's really good. Okay, I'm going to ask my question. I don't know if I'm going to formulate this exactly right, so it might sort of evolve as I'm speaking, but <clears throat> I'm kind of wondering about, and this was something that someone asked me within the chat too, about the reparative nature actually of these texts or these, you know, particularly of the family meals. <clears throat> film I mean we didn't see all of it but somehow you know obviously like visibility sort of the visibility of is an issue and invisibility of sort of queerness and of this person's identity within the context of 
sort of, you know, there's a real identity within the context of the family or the nation or the language, like it's not visible. And it seems to me that the project of making it visible through this tech, through this film in particular, I'm not sure how reparative it is for the author. And may, so maybe you can address that. Maybe that's what's sort of happening in the end, or is it just that exposing the, this erasure and invisibility is actually opening a wound and more, you know what I mean? Not so much repairing as at least <laughs> opening a wound that could then potentially be healed. So in other words, does the family conversation just seems really awkward and painful? Like, is the family a place to go and be like celebrated and recognized? Or is it the family's like, we don't want to bring that up. Like we weren't, we were supportive, right? We never were harsh to you. We were supportive. But like you said, by not talking about it, it's not supportive. Or by throwing out little barbs, like I'm never going to have grandchildren. I mean, you know, is that a supportive space, that bounded space of so the family seems like a, a prison in a way, like a trap in the same way that the language might be, the language not allowing for like a precise, you know, a way to express who you really are because it has a limited kind of vocabulary um, in the same way that the nation might be a trap in that it doesn't allow for difference because it doesn't serve the interests of the nation. So anyway, I just kind of obviously a, a project of visibility is what it's all about, but does it, but in, in essence, do we see that kind of reparative work happening or do we just see um, this exposure of the erasure of those identities and the pain as a starting point? I don't um, know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it does. I personally think that if we look at family meals firstly, I think that there is a lot of reparative work being done. In particular, that they, first of all, if in Buddhist Avalavitra's relationship with her family, if the main impediment was they literally never mentioned that she came out as gay a decade ago, ever, between each other or to their friends, um, for Buddhist Avalavitra, that's really injurious. That has really affected her. Um, and in a clip that's actually not included in the film, she's kind of spiteful about it. Um, in an early trailer, there's a clip of her with a friend and she's saying like, my parents are trying to cure me by just never mentioning me. Um, as if like by not mentioning it, it will disappear. Um, but I do think that part of how I'm understanding reparation is it's not going to work by like fixing the whole, you have to break it up into new parts because the way it's currently structured um, just doesn't even accommodate, first of all, the nuclear family of her parents doesn't accommodate Dana's deviance or like her non-repetition of the happiness script they want for her that actually she kind of sees her brother somewhat having, um, although he's not really present in the film as much. Um, and what was not in the trailer was I, I picked the two scenes with her father and her mother in which we finally do see them break down a little bit. Like he admits that like he should have been there for her. And she also, the mother's defense of the entire film until the very end in which she admits we should have done this because it's really hard. That's why people don't do it. And then in the next scene, she says, Dana says, how are we going to fix this? And her mother says, we'll dig. And Dana says, we'll keep digging as if like, there's not really a productive way out. You just kind of have to like keep going into, I don't want to say the trauma, but like the kind of like associative communal narrative and see what you make out of like the leftover parts. Um, but in, the, in terms of language, I think what Jamaka is doing is a little bit more restricted. Um, there really isn't a way for her to write outside of the gender of Croatian without literally not writing in Croatian or writing in something that is not considered Croatian. Um, I've tried to do a lot of research trying to find more examples of people doing kind of like breaking down the gender of Croatian. And I personally haven't found a lot other than making it gender neutral. Um, so yeah, I think we're a little bit more stuck with language. Um, but I do think by kind of making the the reference of grammatical gender to her sex meaningless. Like she kind of 
games the system. If it's not reliable, what like the masculine or feminine is referring to, and it constantly is changing, like the system was never stable to begin with, I think. Um, and she shows that. But yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that, totally. <laughs> Uh, no, you totally did. And then this is kind of more of a minor point, but I think you mentioned at some point, it was one of, I think it, when you were reading from the, sorry, it was somewhere, somewhere in your text, you talked about like EU funded, like, you know, stuff's coming out on sort of with gay and lesbian EU things. projects, EU yes. funded. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if there's this kind of gay ropa trope, you know, that um, where kind of from the nationalist perspective that this is like, you know, the kind of expression of, of you know, um, gay, queer identities, et cetera, is something that's being like pushed by the West, you know, it's coming from the West and it's some, you know, injurious to the nation <clears throat> in that sense that there's this kind of connection to the outside. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At least in what I've read in particular to bring up a very specific event. Um, so, in an early trailer of the film Family Meals, it, it actually opens with live footage from Zagreb Pride in 2009, even mm -hmm. though that never made the final cut of the film. And that was the event at which on the main square in Zagreb, there was a counter protest organized by um, the like Croatian Pure Rights Party, which is just neo-fascist, neo-Nazi fringe, but they had a couple hundred people there show up. Um, and the like the organizer of that event said they were doing it because like new like they basically are using the legal defense they're saying why do we need to have pride when the laws about discrimination already exist and if people have problems they can appeal through the laws we don't need this europeanized you know system coming in and forcing us to do things that we already have accounted for in our system so there is kind of a criticizing that as an intrusion from Europe as an unwanted, kind of like generically liberal body that takes their autonomy away. But which, which uh, thank you for this, which, which kind of reminds me, you know, we smiled and I looked at, um, you know, at this Chris face and probably Christiane and so on, because this is something is a pattern that we've seen in Sofia, but in other cities as well. I mean, exactly as you described, and I'm, I'm curious as to why this particular cut did not make the movie. Uh, but, you know, later on has been picked up uh, heavily by all state and non-state actors, for instance, when in, in their propaganda, there is a specific um, sort of line developing there uh, in weaponized disinformation, for instance, you know, which repeats uh, on this particular uh, theme of this foreign imposed, you know, um, forceful, you know, models, which, which are unnatural, you know, to the, to the national projects. <clears throat> and maybe Eastern, I know, I think Jason left, um, but yeah, at that particular event, I mean, they had the backing of the, that organization had the backing of the church. They appealed to the church as obviously a kind of, um, a reason to explain why it was unnatural and mm -hmm. kind of that like terrorizing the public space of the city by showing off. Mm -hmm. Clear. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Someone's talking. Who is? Oh, sorry. That was me. Is. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Vlad. Um. Okay. So I'm I'm wondering about um also just in uh, Moyati in my dear you um thinking about right there's this address to the other to the you and there is you know it's a romantic sort of there's this space of intimacy and uh focus on a romantic relationship uh in that work uh in language of love right between two people uh so uh, is there some way that you is do you connect that? Is that maybe one of the ways that you can connect it to family meals uh, specifically? Uh, do you, you know, in terms of these happiness scripts, right, that you bring up, um, I'm just wondering what you think, I guess my larger question is, what do you think Moyati does 
with um, the romantic script. Yeah. Year. I have had a really, first of all, the reason why, um, so I stumbled upon my Dear You as an undergrad and I've stuck with it because I just think it's doing so much more than people are writing about, like in, in Croatian, because no one's writing about it in English. Um, and it's doing so many different things. Like the language thing is happening at the exact, like the criticizing kind of the monolingualism of Croatian and the heteronormativity that it produces is happening at the same time that you have this like relationship between a generic you and I. And so part of me just wants to write a different essay like about that, but I don't know how they connect. I do think that in a lot of ways it's never cited, but I just like, a Butler isn't cited actually, Judith Butler, but I do think Roland Barthes is a really big intertext for Schmack. I should probably just like email and ask her. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot about kind of the rote machinations of a romantic relationship between you and Yasna. Um, like they meet, they go through kind of these generic like steps as they grow up, like going from one comforter on their bed to two comforters. Um, they like go through there's a story in which like I think you refuses you wants Yasna to just say something out loud particularly the phrase I love you um but Yasna refuses to do it because she knows that the minute she says it it won't mean anything it'll just be kind of like sounds in the air because it only really has meaning when it's like written or in a foreign language which I don't know there's a lot about like not her not wanting to engage in the steps of a romantic relationship because she knows that once she does them they're over like once she does a first time with you of anything like going to Montenegro or like foraging for like a spare sea asparagus she says we can never do that again and I can't write the story about when we break up I can't write the last story because it means we'll break up in reality when I write that story so I do think there's kind of like a hesitancy to like carry out those social steps I don't know if that makes any sense I just riffed well I wonder also where so there is this kind of ambivalence in language there where on the one hand the language is very constraining as you were saying and as uh, Mary was saying right can be thought of this as this kind of prison house of heteronormativity but then there's also a way to kind of build this alternate intimate space of the relationship where she wants the almost the relationship to exist only in language or it's a way to um yeah I wonder if there's something like that going on uh there in terms of right this kind of ambivalence um that is present um uh around language as this object of attachment well, I also wonder if there's a little bit of you go kind of yearning in there because with the throwing in of the different dialects, you know, thinking of Croatian as this bounded, you know, separation of something that was much bigger and more fluid and, you know, had its sort of variants, <laughs> you know what I mean? And in a sense, you know, was this larger kind of cultural configuration into something that's this bounded, this is Croatia, you know, um, whether that kind of um, gender questions are intertwined with thoughts about, or, you know, not, I don't want to say Yugo nostalgia, because I, that seems a little kind of banal way to put it, but, but um, sort of a questioning of the nationalist turn and the sort of tourniqueting of these Yugoslav kind of regions into separate nation, national kind of entities. I don't know. Yeah. Does that, do you think that's in there? So well? it's actually really not that present. And I've tried, that's kind of why it sticks out. Um, I mean, there's one story in, in Cyrillic in which she, she and you kind of mourn that they didn't get the generational experience of being pioneers, like the people who were a couple years older than them did. And in that story, yeah, you yeah. do see they never once say the word Yugoslavia, but they circle around these kind of like cultural lacks that these people didn't experience. Like we didn't get to be pioneers. Our schools weren't named after Moshe Piata, like a partisan translator of Marx. And we didn't celebrate um, brotherhood and unity. Um, and then like, we didn't celebrate 
the day of this liberation of this concentration camp, which even though she never mentions it, like she does never mention it's the liberation of concentration camp. She just says, we didn't celebrate this day, which is actually the liber, like there's just kind of these lacks and absences that she never names in that one particular story. But besides that, she's pretty violently criticizing Croatian nationalists in her footnotes and everything. But I mean, Yugoslavia is more of an absence than a presence in many ways. Yet marked by the absence of not mentioning it, but circling around with those cues, right? This is the way I understand that. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I have to ask a food question just because, you know, that's what I do. Uh, so first, what was that green soup? Was that like a pea soup? There was kind of a weird focus in on the soup, but <laughs> but also since and I haven't seen the whole thing, and now I do want to see it, maybe you can send me the link. But right, like close up on the food, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So um, can you talk a little bit more about the food? Um, but also I keep returning my own mind to this idea of the family meal as such a weird contradictory space because in a way it should be it's the comfort of food of your mother and it's this space of you know like where you grew up and where you get together with the people you theoretically love <laughs> but it can also be just such a dark place where you're you know forced to eat things you don't want to eat or forced to have conversations with your crazy relative that you don't want to talk to um, and where you're judged in a way you know and so like it's this like I just think it's an interesting place to focus the focus her work around the meal, not just conversations with family, but around the meal. But so anyway, can that's I, my Can I just, can I tag on to that? Yeah, Chelsea. That, yeah. No, because I was thinking a lot about that, about um, how many kind of eruptive conversations I've seen over the last decade at various family meals. And not, not mm -hmm. necessarily that this happens <laughs> just in the Balkans. This you know, happens a lot of family meals, right? <laughs> but uh, the particular ways that like there, they're also, they're often are not, and I'm thinking more about Kosovo and Albania, but like there's not a lot of attempts to pretend like this is not about to be full of drama, right? Like there's, there is no, like we know what's about to go down. We're all coming to the table. Let's just see how long we can keep this hidden. Yeah, um, how painful, right? You know, yeah, like how long are we gonna try to stretch this out? And, but also in a way too, that I've always really appreciated, um, at least from, from an outsider, because my own experiences were more like, let's not bring things to the table and let's, we'll talk about it later. Like, was, but, but like, I just, and so I was, I was very like watching and thinking about some of the tension there and then hearing, you know, some of the things her mother was saying about, well, I've done this, I've done that. Who told you life wasn't going to involve these things, right? That felt very um, familiar in terms of how many times, like just, just hearing similar things in, at meals. And so I was just curious too about like the, the table itself and what, you know, the table, you know, represents it in that regard, right? Um, because, you because, you know, you have to eat. Like, at some point, people have to eat, right? So you have to come together, but you know, like we, you know, for all, you know, for lack of better words, like, we know that shit's probably about to go down um, often. And so just anyways, if you can, <laughs> I'd yeah. like to hear more about that too. <laughs> um, so I'm not exaggerating when the entire film takes place around a dinner table or in the kitchen. They usually show um, the preparation of the food beforehand and kind of the weird ways like Dana doesn't know how to cook so she like lets everybody else do it um and they make fun of her for like her fridge looks like a manager's fridge it's like cans but fancy cans um so it's a space that she's not very comfortable in she lets everybody else do it but yeah they spend a lot of time preparing the food and then setting the table very ritualistically um and if I'm remembering correctly the film came about because that was the only really interaction that her family had together is they would meet up for meals, particularly her, she had like, honestly, it was like Sunday or Tuesday brunch with her dad every single week. And that's what spurred her. She's like, oh, well, I should just film my meals with my dad. And then she thought I'll do it with all my family. Um, and she hadn't really seen her brother very much. So it's kind of, I think the table is a way to force them to all be in the same place. And at the end, they actually have, so her parents are, they actually never got married, but they separated years ago. Um, and at the end, they have kind of a celebratory birthday lunch. And it's the first time that all four of them have been in the same room in five years. Um, so it really d is like a space that forces you to be together, I think. And Budsavich definitely leaned into that. Um, 
I didn't used to like the title family meals, but I do think it encapsulates the film much better. Um, and the, the food is always like the mom makes mistakes every time she makes a mistake every time she cooks and it's just like, it's fine. We'll add salt, take, drink some wine. Um, all of her conversations, she's like had a glass or two of wine. Um, so I, if you couldn't tell. Um, could you say again, Sam, if you don't mind, because you, Family Meals was not the direct translation from Croatian. What'd you say again? It, it's like, life is not a tropical song or lo- life is not a song of Hawaii. Um, mm-hmm. Like it's not, it's not easy. Oh my good. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's just a lot there of how you get from there to Family Meals. Um, there, I agree. Yeah, yeah that's it's, a it's lot. such yeah, a, long, like- a long arc, you know, because when she mm-hmm. showed us the original versus what is, you know, how, how you get there, you know, definitely goes in this direction. And Sam, uh, if you allow me to uh, pose a question by Michael Keel, you know, who says the building on Dr. Neuberger's question, I'm curious if gender relates to food or food preferences as well. Um, I like this question. Uh, like red meat in America is tied to masculinity, uh, quote unquote, and tradition compared to vegetarianism or, uh, or tofu. Thank you, Michael. Michael, are you asking like in Croatian food in general? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that, but um, sure. I don't know if that qu- my oh, okay. question really answers a lot. Um, just in the, the the you know the filmed meals, I suppose, like how people talk about it, or um, like what yeah, like what they sort of want to eat or expect to eat is like maybe in relation to like these happiness narratives. Um, just yeah, I guess if you have any yeah. thoughts about that, but it might not be. No, in the film, there's definitely a, a gendered element. Um, her, I was at, her dad never makes like full meals. They just drink coffee. Um, but whenever Dana's in the kitchen with her mother, her mother is like trying to, I don't know if I, you have a mom who like tries to teach you recipes, but none of them are written down. She's like trying to tell her how to make things like, oh, this is a cake that's really good for working women. Um, it's super easy. You should learn it. Uh, it really charms you know, it, it'll, I don't know if she, it'll charm the men, but like, you'll be so charming if you can make this. Um, trying to like teach her these like weirdly gendered skills. And of course the mother's cake fails. It's supposed to be like three stories tall and it's tiny. So it's a really good symbol of like the way she completely fails to do this kind of like gendered skill that she keeps in the back of her pocket. Um, and there's another scene in which they're all having lunch at the end and her mother is trying to have the bottle of wine open so she said no just wait let the men do it and Dana's like really offended she's like I can do this and so she forces herself to like pop the bottle open as kind of like a I don't know like a little f you to her mom um she makes a face to the camera which you don't really ever get to see she's just so miserable for most of the film Well, that's great. I think that that might be something worth exploring. I mean, just how food and its preparation, serving, you know, all the rituals have such gendered kind of connotations and how that, you know, might feed into her discomfort or, you know, kind of just be sort of performing some of the issues that she's kind of looking at anyway, in terms of family dynamics. Okay, Chelsea? Oh yeah, and to kind of build on that too, though, and we, we've kind of touched on this some, but also too, what I see um, from what you've presented today and just kind of thinking more broadly about um, how people, and particularly about parents, care through cooking and food, right? So discussions about maybe not caring in the right way or responding or supporting in the right way but feeling very contradictory for someone who thinks that they care and support and love through cooking and through sharing and trying to prepare food and prepare somebody to be able to feed themselves, right? Like, um, the tension that's there um, that I would imagine if I watched the entire film, probably see more from her mother, especially. Um, and, 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 and that being something that's, you know, again, generalizable to other areas, it's not just, but, but I think that also is very present. Um, especially with the insistence on how how much she cooks and tries to share that cooking with her, right? Despite not doing such a good job at it. So, but what was the soup? Was that like a pea soup or what? I don't know. Maybe. 
It you could keep have been... returning to the to the substance of the <laughs> soup, right? It could have been like a cream, like a cream soup. broccoli, though, right? I mean, that's also really co common to to like have a very yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. It's so in Kosovo in Albania, it's very. Well, common I've never to... had broccoli in the Balkans personally, but oh my gosh, it's... really? Oh no, it's yeah. oh, it's super popular in Albania. Is it like, big it's... now? Okay, it it is both broccoli and spinach, but like to the point where it's so pureed, it's green, and you're like, I'm not sure which soup this is until you try it, right? But it's creamed and it's pureed. Okay, well, anyways, Samantha, I was thinking also, um, you know, thinking about depressing family meals, right? The second the second film you're working on is called Don't Stare at My Plate. I mean, that's even more depressing. Um, so I wonder like, if you are going to connect those two films together around this topic of family meal, depressing um, uh, and really difficult family meals. I definitely plan on it in the introduction. Um, for reference, the second film in my other chapter, Quit Staring at My Plate, they have these really horrible, gross meals where you can't even tell what they're eating. There's flies. It's like they all hunch over and like try to finish their food as fast as they can. Um, their lunches are really gross every day when they bring it. Um, so it's just kind of like the opposite of like, whereas I don't know where Dana's mother tries really hard to like make good meals. There's just kind of a lack of appeal or nutrition to begin with. And the other film, Quit Staring at My Plate. Why did the credits say catered by or something? It said catered by, I mean, it went really fast, but it I feel like it's the trailer. I thought it said catered. I, I, saw, saw, I saw tasted and I was wondering. By Dana. Oh, okay. It's like a joke. <laughs> I could have oh, eat all of them. And I was thinking in my head, I, was, I wonder what that's supposed to mean. Like what the what word I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, it went really fast. But. Well, isn't the point that right. the soup is not a tropical song? That seems to be the point, right? <laughs> that's the contrast that's salient there. So anyways, yeah, that's a good well, one. Sam, is this, is that, are either of these films available like on YouTube or anywhere where people could watch them? Um, Quit Staring at My Plate is on, I think, Daily Motion, but it doesn't have subtitles. Uh, mm -hmm. And so Quit... Family Meals is not available. I ha I'm, wa I'm watching it through like the production company. They're letting me do it, but I think we should. Oh, okay. I think we should show it. I don't know. It'd be good. It's fifty minutes. Sure. Yeah. Get get in touch with me about that if it's something we need to get permission from them for or something like that. That would be they cool. would they love having people see it. I think they'd be really into it. That'd be a fun watch Maybe. party. Because then if it, that's that short, we can watch it and then have a, you know, discussion. We could watch it idea. over wine and pea soup or something. <laughs> BYOB, of course. <clears throat> okay, well, this is probably a good place to end. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. And thank, thank you, you so much, much Sam, today. for sharing this wonderful work with us. We're really excited to see where it goes and just to follow you in your career, hopefully, in Balkan Studies. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will be here next week. Um, yes. Next week. With, we are, yeah. With Smokey. With Smokey. With Smokey. We're, we'll, be, we'll be looking at uh, Ponzi schemes and uh, illegal uh, accumulation of capital in, in the wild 90s on the Balkans. Uh, Sam, one more time, thank you. Oh, and awesome. uh, Dr. Neuberger, I just wanted to remind if you can uh, say a word about oh, yeah. possibly emails in the survey, because yes. you see that we steadily are growing and we're welcoming um, many people which are outside of UT. Uh, so Dr. Neuberger. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people have already left, but you'll get a quick survey and an email and it will literally take you like five minutes or less. But if you could fill it out, it's just kind of helpful for us to see who's come and who might be interested in speaking at Balkan Circle in the future, or what kind of topics people are interested okay. in. So yeah. if you have a minute, just fill it out. Um, and uh, we will we'll probably keep sending it out to new people and things like that. So, or it's now in the chat, the link to it. It's in the link, um, But yes. it we'll should you take you literally five minutes or less. It's not long. We'll, yeah. we'll well, thank you, everyone.